That which causes kings to turn. The rope that binds water. That which falls short of the mark. The door that shuts out sorrows. That which knows not of the cares of this world. The honor of the sleep that measures time. Will you accept our challenge, great king? Very well then. Her eyes shall no more look upon your face until the spoken truth forces them open once again. If questions were living things, there would be a race as varied as the one that asked them into being, existing at once at the height of wisdom and the depths of foolishness. In questions, one can as soon find a guide into the light as a path into the darkest depths. To answer some questions, a man will endure pain, struggle, and starvation. To avoid the same, others will cheat, lie, and steal. This is the story of a few such questions and the bricks they laid in the foundations of an empire. When Yamiyonga's messengers walked out of the shadows into the court of Isaza Nyakitoto, my nephew, our king, it might have seemed to all gathered that they brought with them only six questions. But questions are very much like cockroaches. Where one is found, many more are sure to be waiting in the wings. At first, challenging the readers was a novel, even amusing pursuit for my nephew. But as the days dragged on and no answers could be found that would rouse the messengers from their seemingly endless sleep, Isaza's curiosity began to warp and bloom into obsession. In pursuit of answers, he called first the elders of the kingdom, then all the royal advisors and wise men, but it counted for little. No matter how many times the sun traded domains with the moon, no matter which of the wisest, most strategic minds the king threw at them, though answers poured in from every corner, still messengers did not star. Isaza sent for us, the Saza, chiefs over his lands. From Buganda to Chitara, Nkore to Busoga and Busindi, we came from all over to fail at childish games. And while by royal order, its leaders were received from every corner, the kingdom did not magically come to need less leadership. No. In the days after I was summoned as my girl Kazana and I traveled from Busongora to the royal court, I, Kogere, first sister of Ngozaki Rutahinduka, saw this with my own eyes. The uncertain and chaotic seeds that questions planted in the vacuums the leaders had left in our once thriving kingdom. Is this the wisdom of the Batembuzi? Useful as a wet branch in the heart of a cooking fire? Can no one in all the land answer? Put these riddlers to shame? There, there is there's one who can. Who spoke? I, I did, my king. And if I should be so bold... Bold is right. What gives you, a human halfling, the right to raise your voice in this assembly of gods? Knowledge, my king. That which I hold now and that which I do not. You see, I have been lost in riddles myself, great king. Of where I began and where I belong now. But in my short years of confusion, I have found great kindness and joy in the house of your chief Kogere. It has been clear to me that as we traveled from Busongora to your court, how much the troubles of the people have vexed her, the turmoil these riddles have caused in the lives of many who know little of their existence. It is in the service of my chief that I so boldly speak in this assembly, my king, in return for Mark Kogere's peace of mind. I offer you the answers you seek. And if you should fail to pay that which you offer up in full? Then my king, I offer up my life. Maybe it will be enough to make up for the difference. But first, I ask that you give me the hands of your servants and the minutes still dawn, that I might earn whatever is coming to me. A compelling case, child. Your offer is a hard one to refuse. I accept your bargain. Whatever you need, you shall have. Proceed. And proceed that girl did, taking charge of the court like a general, marshalling her forces. This way and that, she sent the servants of the court. Hey, 
Light me a fire. Bring me flour of millet and pot of clay. Bring the water here to boil over the fire. She added the flour and stirred. At first, the mingling stick moved easily through the mixture, but soon, the contents of the pot began to fight back. Suddenly, raising it above her head with both her hands, Kazana brought the steaming pot crashing down to the floor. Most in the room recoiled from the thunderous crack of the breaking pot, expecting to be showered in boiling water and shards of smashed pottery. And yet, though its cracks were clear for all to see, the pot held together and no liquid leaked from its broken walls. This is Kalo, the rope that binds water. Just then, the truth of Kazana's words was nearly drowned out by a great commotion as the lowing of cows strangled the silence out of the night air. Who would dare spoil the king's milk? Look kindly upon the actions of your servant. They are not without calculation. For now it is clear for all to see that which causes my king to turn. It was more than undeniable actually. In retrospect, it was so simple. For all the truly knew Isaza knew that nothing could steal his attention like cows. And yet, even as we turned back, a greater shock awaited us. There, seated at the very foot of the king's throne, closer than any mortal had ever been allowed to the royal seat, was Kazana, playing with a toddler. Unfazed, they played on even as the king approached them. Unfazed, they remained even as Kazana lifted the child up and placed him in the king's arms. Isaza had never had to bear the indignities of caring for anything so complex as another human life, and so the child immediately crawled out of his untrained arms onto the throne bringing mud onto the skins there and breaking the royal milk gourd in the process. Oblivious to the looks of horror directed his way, the child played on in the king's throne until Kazana finally picked him up and returned him to one of the servant women. Behold, that which is void of understanding, for though you stare a million darts into his back, neither royalty, nor poverty, war, nor peace mean even a little to a child. The world has yet to teach him to care. You dishonor us with your games, child. Who are you to dirty the royal seat? You speak truly, Elder. I apologize for the lengths I must go to serve our king. Ask yourself, though, how my insolence was possible in the first place. Has not every child in this kingdom had tell the king's ferocious hunting dogs that supposedly guard his throne day and night? And yet here I stand, insolent and without opposition, while the very things that should guard our king frolic and with a child. Tell me, are these fabled gods simply legend? Or has peace and prosperity blunted their age? Is this not a mark fallen well short of? As the king's advisors wondered at how the mysterious girl before them could know such hidden things, their thoughts were intruded upon by the crowing of the rooster, announcing the dawning day, reminding them of how long they had all struggled at this endeavor. For they had struggled long, and their eyes all betrayed the truth their loyalty refused their mouths to say to their king. They were tired, tired of the games, tired of ignoring their duty, Tired of receiving messenger after messenger from the home counties with tales of decay and building unrest. And maybe it was this tiredness that opened their minds to the obvious. Or it was the fact that the answer was boring a hole in their eardrums at that very moment. But even as Kazana spoke, the advisors already knew the answer. The rooster that crows, he owns the sleep that measures time. And here, my king, though I have given the best as I am able, I must accept my fate. Though I promised you answers in full, and the dawn is upon us, this door that shuts out sorrow, it is as much a mystery to me as it is to all here gathered. Better that you had not spoken at all, child, than to bring me so close to my goal, only to leave me stranded and adrift. You shall surely meet the fate your tongue has chosen for you. Hold back the winds of your anger, nephew. Spare the child. 
though that which is frustratingly close, yet unreachable, might blind you to it at this moment, it is how words that have lightened the burden you carried only yesterday, sixfold. Be merciful to this child. Your advisor speaks true, Hardsman King. Though blood might yet be shed here today, we wish only for it to be shed in joy and not sorrow. For even as we set forth our questions, though it be a dirty trick, we knew that there was one among the number only we could answer. You see, great king, while we carry with us many gifts, none is more unique or precious than that which our Lord Nyamyonga offers you now. The forging of a brotherhood, the dawn of a shared destiny between our kingdoms. Allies in times of struggle. Most treasured friends in time of celebration. Will you spill blood this day, great king? And walk through the door that shuts out sorrow? As evening turned to dusk, and the celebrations of Isaza's court built in intensity behind them, Yamiyonga's emissaries turned their gaze homeward. Confident in their winnings, their mission seemingly as resounding a success as the jubilant drumbeats that faded into the night as they moved farther and farther into the underworld. Soon, they stood before an equally jubilant Nyamiyonga. As he took possession of his prize, this bloodied bean, the door to a new frontier of greatness for the king under the world. And yet, too soon it will appear, did they leave the presence of their king. For though most concerned believed that this door would open unto a plain of a great many riches for the kingdom under the world, one among their number knew the more pedestrian truth that lay behind the facade. You see, Nemyonga, ever one to hedge his bets, had sent more spies than was immediately obvious, even to his own messengers. Knowing children who then knack for getting into places they shouldn't and delivering truth more brutally than most, he had entrusted the duty of the mission's rear watch to one such child. If the emissaries had lingered but a while longer in Yamiyonga's presence, they too might have been privy to this child's tale. They would have heard the young spy tell of how, upon hearing of the offer of blood brotherhood, the blood had drained from the faces of his other's chiefs. How the hardman king's advisors had led him to what they thought was a secluded space and beseeched him not to enter into such an insoluble alliance with an unknown king of an even lesser known world. They would have heard of how Isaza acquiesced to their demands and ordered a palace guard, a mere common man, to swallow the coffee bean covered in Yamiyonga's blood. How the peasant had drawn his lowly blood and smothered the other bean in it. And yet, all things considered, it was likely a good thing that the emissaries did not stay to witness their king drink so deeply from the bitter gourd of deception and treachery. A tonic he had so frequently served to many that opposed his will. That they were not around to witness his humiliation at being tricked into a brotherhood with a common human being was a blessing. For they may have not been able to look his rage full in the face and leave to tell of it. Instead, Nyamiyonga chose to find a more practical outlet for his rage than wanton destruction. He took it and used it to stoke the fires of the vengeance which, at that very moment, his mind had already begun to map out. <laughs> <laughs>